Like the scalability isn't important until it suddenly is. The centralization isn't important until it suddenly is. And privacy isn't important until it suddenly is. The solo staker is a very particular animal. It is somebody that understands the value of decentralization. If you're a big pool that has thousands of validators and you're constantly producing blocks, you are bound to get some lot, some of these big payout, big MEV blocks, which are also known as lottery blocks. The inverse scenario is like a solo staker that has one validator and proposes around two to three blocks per year. The chance of this validator getting a lottery block is tiny, very small. So if we agree that home stakers are more valuable in terms of the centralization and resilience for the network, why are we paying them less? Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Edu Antonian Polanski, founder and project lead of Adapnode. And Adapnode is a solo staking hardware and software provider, and we will go into the nitty gritty of that in just a moment after I tell you about our sponsors this week. If you're looking to stake your crypto with confidence, look no further than Course One. More than 150,000 delegators, including institutions like BitGo, Pantera Capital, and Ledger, trust Chorus One with their assets. They support over 50 blockchains and are leaders in governance or networks like Cosmos, ensuring your stake is responsibly managed. Thanks to their advanced MEV research, you can also enjoy the highest staking rewards. You can stake directly from your preferred wallet, set up a white label node, restake your assets on Eigenlayer or Symbiotic, or use their SDK for multi chain staking in your app. Learn more at chorus.one and start staking today. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a collective dedicated to advancing a decentralized future. Gnosis leads innovation with Circles, Gnosis Pay, and Metri, reshaping open banking and money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they're building a more resilient, privacy-focused internet. If you're looking for an L1 to launch your project, Gnosis Chain offers the same development environment as Ethereum with lower transaction fees. It's supported by over 200,000 validators, making Gnosis Chain a reliable and credibly neutral foundation for your applications. Gnosis DAO drives Gnosis governance where every voice matters. Join the Gnosis community in the Gnosis DAO forum today. Deploy on the EVM compatible Gnosis Chain or secure the network with just one GNO and affordable hardware. Start your decentralization journey today at Gnosis.io. Edwin Paul, it's a pleasure to have you on. The pleasure is entirely mine. So we've we've known each other for a very long time, um, but it's the first time we're actually talking about Dapno on the show. Edwin, you've actually been on kind of on one of the on one of the Dapcon episodes, I think. But I don't think we've actually ever really ca covered Dabnode, have we? Well, we talked some time ago when the merge happened. Yes. I've been in the epicenter and it was great. But yeah, I think it's important to cover also Dabnode here, I guess. Absolutely. Cool. Before we dive right in, tell me a bit about yourselves and uh, your backgrounds. Maybe we'll start with you, Edu. Okay, great. Well. I've been around since 2017. It has been a long trip to be here today. <laughs> a lot of things uh, in the middle. I started uh, working with Jordi, making some audits like MakerDAO. And during this audit, the idea of, of Dabnot comes to my mind, and Jordi's one, and we started to make this happen. And yeah, the product has evolved a lot, um, and we have uh, try to adapt to the market during these years. Um, so yeah, really interesting travel to, to be here today and a lot of things to share with you. You cut out for just a little bit, but kind of you said um, that kind of uh, Jordi uh, was, was, this was also Jordi's idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The founders of Dunlord uh, are Jordi Valina. Griffin and myself, and yeah, mainly the idea that um, comes to my mind and Jordi's one and Griff is, is about decentralization. We realized that at that moment we were creating decentralized technology with, but without having decentralized hardware. 
and we started to make this happen. Absolutely. And I mean, both of them um, are now involved with other projects primarily, but kind of they've also been on the show before. So uh, Jody actually several times for uh, for RMS and Polygon um, and kind of the ZK stack that he's building, ZK EVM and so on. And Griff has been on some of the community shows. What about you, Paul? Well, um, well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for uh, thank you for inviting us. And uh, I think I I started in crypto um, mining Dogecoin in 2014. Fair, and, fair, fair, fair. Uh, the reason why I decided to mine Dogecoin is because I was late to Bitcoin, but I realized that it it was the same code. Uh, so if I learned how to mine Dogecoin, I would just need to scale up my hardware, and it would uh, it would basically be very a very similar experience. Um, then, like I sort of went on to the corporate route. I did my MBA. I um, I worked in corporate for a while, and in 2016, I met uh, Griff Green, who uh, with whom I collaborated in Gibbeth, and then. Uh, in 2019, when I was ready to quit corporate, uh, he introduced me to Edu. And uh, in the first, I think in the first five minutes of having a chat with Edu, I knew that the next day I was going to resign from my job. Um, I think it was everything that didn't exist in, in the corporate environment where I was. Uh, so I, I, since then, since 2019, I've been working with, uh, with Dapnote. And when uh, all the founders took a step back and, and went to other projects, I decided to uh, take over and, and try, to, try to bring it to where we are now. What were the things that uh, you felt Edu and Dapnote offered that were lacking in your, uh, in your legacy job? Yeah, so um, I think at that point... It was like, you could go straight to the point. You could go straight to what we're discussing um, without endless layers of politics, of thinking, uh, which department would that fall into, whose responsibility is the, it was this. It was just about doing something that was for a greater cause. And uh, Edu was just so patient with me. Like I, I <laughs> pretended I was, I was in a job interview mode and I pretended I knew a lot and Edu was uh, super down to earth and uh, super uh, didactic and tried to educate me a lot uh, in a super humble way as he is. So um, I was, uh, I was humbled and I was like, yeah, this, this straight to the point smarts is uh, with whom I want to, to be working with. I feel yeah, I feel yeah. I think that's generally a virtue in the ecosystem. So uh, it's also what I really enjoy. Edu, tell us about the founding story behind uh, Dapnode. So kind of like it was you, Jordi and Griff, and kind of there was the maker audit. So what what kind of um, what kind of drove you to say, look, we should make um, we should make hardware for people who want a solo stake. Yeah, well, that's it's a really good question, and um, yeah, it has been an evolution to to be honest. So the the first idea was just to create software, not hardware, <laughs> and our intention was to create a kind of um, a project, not to make a business with it, but to make it so self sustainable. Just with the idea to provide a, a public good to people, people allow people to have decentralized technology. It was not just staking at that moment, because at that moment staking was kind of an idea only, <laughs> but it was about to have um, privacy, to be able to connect to the centralized network in a really decentralized manner. So yeah, we, we started uh, the project just myself, and, and later on we started to ask for some grants to maintain the project. We, we got grants from uh, Gnosis, we got grant from, uh, grants from Ethereum Foundation, uh, Aragon, Meli, these three actors were the first one to support us. And it has been uh, a small project. Uh, from the beginning, only four people at most uh, during the first three years, mainly. 
because yeah, the, the idea was just to try to evolve and, and maintain the project and survive. I mean, we have survived, I think, three bear markets. I don't know the number now, <laughs> but for that you need to be very careful and 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 just continue building. Um, so yeah, we we started this initial idea of having this open source software for for anyone, but then we realized that we need something more because people at the end of the day wants to have a kind of um, uh, out of the box solution, make uh, their life simple. Because at the end, that not the idea behind that not it's to make it easy for anyone to run decentralized networks. That was the initial idea. So that is why it was important also to combine the software with the hard hardware solution. Obviously, running a hardware company is not easy at all. <laughs> it's, yes. it's a pain <laughs> for us. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, I think it's needed and I think it's providing value to the user. That is the, the first goal of the, of the project, to provide value to final users, to make them um, ac access to this kind of technology that without this facility would be impossible. So, yeah, mainly... Um, some years working on this, then uh, something that changed everything. It was uh, the, the well, the proof of stake and, and the merge, obviously, because it's when people start to using that not for something more than than privacy. And at that moment, we start to solve uh, to solve more and more hardware for people that want to run solo staking at home. And, and yeah, really, really proud of the of the success that we achieved with this. To be honest. So who are your users? Because kind of like um, the the privacy, I mean, I totally understand um, the privacy point that you were making. So kind of like whenever you kind of um, connect to say, and at that time it was mostly MetaMask. So kind of like that would go to Infura. So kind of Infura would kind of like have all your data. And even if in principle, kind of like you had been super careful about kind of like where the funds on your address for gas and so on came from, uh, Infura might be able to kind of infer who you are and kind of and so on. So I totally understand the the value proposition there in principle. In practice, kind of very few people are actually willing to kind of pay for privacy a in funds and b in time and upkeep and so on. So kind of who who were your users then and has this changed? Um, yeah, sure. I think at the at the beginning it was uh, a lot of uh, enthusiasts, a lot of uh, people who really really believed in Ethereum, really believed in the centralized technologies, uh, IPFS, um, and they wanted to contribute to the network. It was more a contribution to the network than to uh, than to uh, like take really use it of course there's always been like a fair share of developers who prefer to have their own node because then you have like limit unlimited querying and um you don't uh, you don't need to pay uh, an api or being rate limited etc but uh at the beginning it was mostly people who who really believed in ethereum um and the the shift really came with the first test nets for what was then known as ethereum 2 uh, the Medalla testnet, the all these testnets um, that that came out, people started realizing that proof of stake was going to become a reality, and especially those who were not particularly technical, uh, they figured out that with that node it could be an amazing solution to just uh, one click deploy and and be running those testnets. So I think like in the matter of like the three months from the first testnet going out. Uh, like we like six or six or ten x our the people in our riot channel we were using Matrix and and Riot back then, uh, so it was wild. It was when we decided that they, yeah we that that was probably a good pivot to focus on uh, on staking above uh, anything else. Yeah, and I mean, what, what maybe just as background, so kind of before proof of stake, obviously we had proof of work. Um, and there you kind of, you needed very specialized hardware, right? So kind of, it wasn't something that kind of you would run on your on your regular machine at home. So kind of like people, bu uh, people build and bought specialized hardware. So kind of offering that um, out of the box kind of for people to kind of just install on kind of like the machines they never turn off in their homes. That wasn't kind of an option. So kind of, it was literally just running a full node kind of getting the complete state and then kind of after the um the transition to um 
uh, proof of stake or kind of like uh, even the lead up of that um, transition kind of people were were actually uh, validators on the network properly. So I hear that kind of you had a lot of idealists. Staking is also can also be a profitable business. Um, ha- has kind of this crowd shifted somewhat from kind of like the people who just wanted to be part of the network? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's So I think the solo staker is a very particular animal. It is somebody that understands the value of decentralization. And of course, uh, in general, it searches for the yield that Ethereum provides. But it's looking for something more. It's looking for a higher level of contribution and a higher level of exposure. Um, the, to, to get access to the yield of Ethereum, it's very easy to just buy into any liquid staking protocol and, and then you'll have access to that yield. Um, so definitely, like if you need to invest in hardware or you need to invest in something else, it's because you want a higher degree of control. And here, like there's, there's multiple multiple personalities or multiple uh, overlaps. There's the the developer that wants to run their own node and again, query it and at the same time manages to use it for validation. There's the OG the, that that has massive amounts of ETH from the early days. And uh, maybe they were even stockpiling 1,500 ETH as it was supposed to be the first staking uh, <laughs> specs. Uh, and, and then all of a sudden they found out that they could run uh, a lot of validators with that. So, so yeah, mostly it's somebody that, that definitely wants access to that yield and wants the economic interest, but that also believes that their work um, on validating at home is valuable for the ecosystem as well. Is that also how you determine um, which networks to support? Because kind of like you support networks beyond Ethereum. So I know for a fact you uh, support Gnosis because I validate for Gnosis. Um, I also know you support IPFS and Hopper and a couple of others. So kind of like, how do you, how do you determine which networks to support? <laughs> that, that's a really good question to be honest. Obviously, we, we are trying, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are on a small team. Uh, so the work of maintaining several networks, several packages is hard for us. So we need to be very careful choosing them. Um, especially we take a look to the value that provide to the users and also if they are aligned with our values. That, that I think is more the most important thing. At the end of the day, uh, Dabnode is kind of a general purpose machine, right? So we would like to have as much as possible, but then obviously uh, these are the metrics kind of, right? Uh, that they are providing value to the final user, that is uh, decentralized, that uh, is offering, yeah, a, 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 Several things, and, and going back to the previous question or linking it to it is 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 um, we'll see how people are not getting too much about privacy, but uh, also privacy is related to censorship resistance. That was also one of the initial values, and it's sad, but people only realize about the importance of this when they are in trouble, when uh, government start to censorship you, and that is when you realize, realize this that you need this technology. Otherwise, it's like people forget about it. And from day to time, this happened around the world, and it's uh, a big push for us, probably. <laughs> but uh, it's important to keep in mind that we are building decentralized networks. Uh, NOS is, uh, I don't know the, the number right now, Paul maybe knows how many validator solo stakers are in, in NOSIS, but I think it's 30% or something like that. Yeah, just in excess of 30%. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing to see how this, this, this network is centralized, right? And how we are, in our side, helping to make that happen. And, and, and at the end of the day, we are creating decentralized network for this reason, not because it's more efficient. I mean, if you go to centralized sequencers, you are going to get much better performance, right? <laughs> But then why we are building decentralized technology just to have these, these properties? I think if I may add to this, um, I th- one very smart uh, design choice that, uh, that Edu and Jordi did at the very beginning was to really think about Dabnode as an ecosystem and to, to create the SDK. So actually anybody can create uh, any sort of 
apps or any sort of dab note packages or dab note this or dapps as we call decentralized apps right um so it's not so much who do we try to support but also who is able to to be part of the ecosystem and the answer is anybody uh, all of the networks can uh like if you can dockerize your node it can be deployed on dab node through a through a dab node app through the sdk and for and then, then of course, like the ones that we have supported since the beginning are the ones that, as Edu said, are completely aligned with uh, with our values, right? Those are the ones that that we've been pushing through and maintaining ourselves when the teams, um, the, the client implementer teams were too busy or something. Um, then we've been putting our own efforts into making it available on Tapnote. I want to come back to kind of like the staking philosophy and outlook later, but before that, can we maybe kind of quickly cover? Um, the tech uh, aspects of Dapnode. So, kind of like if you look at the tech stack that powers Dapnode, um, what are the major components and how do they work together? Oh, okay, I can do this one probably. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, from the very beginning, we envisioned this project like a totally decentralized platform. So, that is why uh, the first thing that we did it was to create, um, to deploy the Aragon smart contract, the NPM. Um, the APM, just to be able to distribute versions of the packs in a decentralized manner. So we link, link this smart contract to IPFS uh, plus ENS, and this allows us to make a kind of a package manager distribution in a decentralized, pure decentralized manner. So that means that if someone publishes a package, no one can block you. No one can um, remove that package from the network because it's completely decentralized. And that was one of the core values of, of the technology. And then, yes, the, the other part of this is what we want to distribute, and then is, is Docker. So we create a platform of Dockers that uh, are distributed in, in this in this system, and that makes quite easy to, to develop an application for Darnet, as Paul mentioned, because the process is just to take the Darnet SDK, just to create a Docker image, uh, upload it to IPFS, and then link to a smart contract, and with that, anyone in the world can install it. And, and I think that that's great, but also, I mean, we have been talking a lot of about uh, blockchain, but that, that is not just that. Uh, at the end of the day, something that we are trying to do is to bring home back the computers because it's like people um, are just not having this kind of computer at home. They are using laptops and other things, and we are trying to force them back to have this. And at the moment that you have a, a computer at your home, you can do more things like uh, time machine. Uh, you can have your own cloud for uh, photos. You can have not just blockchain. And, and mainly that is the, the, the idea and having a decentralized uh, distributor system for this. I think there's a, there's a Naval tweet that I, that I really like. Um, I think it goes something like this, like, like scalability isn't important until it suddenly is. The centralization isn't important until it suddenly is. And privacy isn't important until it suddenly is. So I think Dabnode is ready um, to, to make this happen at any single point and for any platform to be, to be ready for, uh, for either needs for scalability, the centralization, privacy. So walk me through this. So I'm a vanilla user. So kind of I, I say I want to use, I want to say Sake um, on Gnosis and Ethereum. Um, I have a dab node. I kind of plug it in. I kind of uh, connect it to the internet. Um, what do I need to do then? Once you connect your dab nodes, um, we, we've tried to design the whole flow to be extremely easy and to not have to use command line at any point. So basically when you plug the machine to your router and you turn it on, it will start emitting a Wi-Fi hotspot and you will connect with this with your device, with it your phone or your laptop or whatever you connect to that hotspot. And then you have to visit my.dapnode, which is being served by the dapnode itself. So basically you use your dapnode from your browser and from this browser, you can go through the configuration flow, and then you can change the password of that initial Wi-Fi. You can uh, configure access through VPN, and this is important to have access to your DAB node 
from wherever you are in the world, not when you're next to it and, and in range of this initial Wi-Fi thing. Um, and then after this initial configuration uh, and configuring the way you want to access it, then you can start installing packages, right? And installing apps. And for this, there are two modes. There's the DAP store. And in the DAP store, you can find all of the packages that people can create through the SDK and that we have published as well. Um, and then there's the stakers UI. And the stakers UI is a very specific flow for Ethereum-based uh, blockchains. Right now, we have uh, three of them. We have Ethereum, Gnosis Chain, and Luxo. And basically, the, in, in the flow, it, it guides you through um, configuring your execution client, your consensus client. Then you are forced to install a Web3 signer. That's where the key stores uh, and of your validators will live. And then you can choose whether you want MEV, uh, MEV boost or not. So this is monkey proof, basically. Like it's, it's, you cannot go to the next step unless you have chosen one of each. And, and then you click uh, apply and Dabnode uh, then uh, installs all the clients and configures all the connection among them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of like the flow that you would do to start validating. Then you would need to create these keys, these validation keys somewhere else, and then upload them onto, onto your dab node, and you'll basically start validating a proof of stake chain. This is always kind of like, w when you hear this from Techie, it's kind of like monkey proof. It's usually not monkey proof. And I don't think it's monkey proof, <laughs> but I can I can attest to the fact. So I mean, I I I'm a techie myself, but I know plenty of uh, people who are not devs who actually run dev nodes. So kind of like within Gnosis, we actually encourage everyone to kind of run nodes. And a lot of the large parts of the non-dev team actually successfully run nodes at home. Um, so this is very much this is very much attainable for uh, interested non-devs for sure um so so tell us about the dap store so kind of um is it is it fully permissionless so could i could i um uh, could i kind of uh upload some sort of malicious docker there yeah this is um, a really good question um we have uh two repositories in Dabnet. One is the Dabnet repository, that is the one that we control. Uh, it's the one that we take care of, and we are 100% uh, sure uh, that everything is fine and nothing can be breaking because of the reports that we are publishing then. And then we have a completely permissionless repository that is the public uh, Dabnet.is. So, yeah, the idea is anyone can publish on the public. Um, and then, obviously, this is the jungle. You need to be really careful what you are installing, but I mean, there are really interesting things also in the public, like, I don't know, optimizing packets or uh, or community maintaining packages that are trusted. So yeah, at the end, we really try to combine these, these both things, uh, one more trustful and one more trustless. <laughs> And with the idea of, of creating an ecosystem, because at the end of the day, it's like um, regular repositories, like the, the app store that you have in your mobile phone uh, in Android, right? So you can install an, uh, an application that you found everywhere around the internet, or you can just use the official one. So yeah, it's, it's hard because at the end of the day, people are storing value on, on this hardware. So that is why we need to try to balance and protect users of not installing uh, the thing that are not correct. <laughs> What's the process of um, updating your nodes like for a user? Because kind of like, as we all know, kind of like these updates happen regularly and they are often somewhat manual. So how do you how do you kind of balance security and, and usability in these scenarios? The, um, I think the key here is that once you install a package, um, these, this package is signed by the key of the developer. So somebody trying to spoof a, uh, an update or something like this, it wouldn't pass the validation checks um, for, uh, for like the, the, the DAPNO does. And 
first of all, they couldn't even publish into the same uh, into the same repository into the same smart contract because the permissions wouldn't allow it. Mm, but there is this uh, develop trusted developer key system that sort of helps you manage which developers do you want to trust. And this also works for the the public DApp Store as well, right? Like if in the public DApp Store, um, you have decided to trust uh, some developer there because you you trust them and you, you've met them and there are some people who, who have a reputation in the space and they have published packages, um, then you you will not be alerted or you will be able, you'll be allowed to download these packages and update them, et cetera, et cetera. If a package is updated by a uh, an address, a wallet, or signed by a wallet that you do not trust, you'll be alerted, so you can uh, you can make sure that that this is a person to do it that you trust, or like an update that you trust. Now, when it comes to the updates themselves, um, because Dapnode is uh, already online. Uh, 24 7 and it scans the this repository the smart contract this aragon package manager that we were talking about whenever the developer publishes a new version of it uh, the user will be alert will be alerted so the dab node will read the smart contract will read the event and will say hey there's a new uh there's a new version available and you can even set up automatic updates so it will automatically update to the newest version the newest version of the of the DAP node package, which is really handy because basically it takes the maintenance to to only looking at your DAP node when something goes wrong. Um, you can of course opt in or opt out of those auto auto updates, and you can check and, and manually uh, update uh, the the packages yourself. So so how often do things actually go wrong? So say I set it to auto update, how how often would you expect I kind of have to check in and manually? do something, bother people on uh, the DAP node Discord and so on? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, it kind of like the, the things that go wrong are usually not related to DAP node. The things that go wrong are usually related to uh, like the, the power failing at home and then disconnecting the machine. And then the database of the execution layer client uh, gets corrupted and you have to resync again. Um, or the internet goes down, or they change your IP, um, and uh, or there's something with the router, and then you lose access through through VPN. So, Dabnode itself is so if everything goes well, you rarely have to look at it, and that's actually a bit of a problem because people um, are missing out on on new cool features and, and new things because they just don't have to look at their Dabnode ever again uh, after setting it up. Uh, but if like if you live in an area where the light is constantly going on and off, like you you can expect that at some point you will have to resync your execution client because the database will will be corrupted. Okay, fair. What proportion of DAP nodes run on DAP node hardware? Ooh, that's an excellent question. Probably my favorite. Um, and the answer is we have no idea. Really. The reason why we have no idea is because we do not capture any telemetry by default. Um, and we know the DAP nodes that we have sold, of course, but we have no idea if you installed the free open source software into your own machine. So we we can only tell you about the DAP nodes that we have sold, but not about the proportion that these represent over the total amount of DAP nodes that we have. So, um, and this is by design because, like, as, as Edu was saying, privacy was one of, like, the, the core principle. But, but you know how many DAP nodes there are in total, right? Uh, no, no, we don't. I mean, we know the ones that we have sold. But you don't know how many people actually run DAP node packages for, for kind of validations? No. Um, okay. the, the only things that we can measure are proxy metrics, which basically is so by default, if you're using DAP node to validate, the default graffiti will say validating from DAP node. So then we can go and look at the validators that have this graffiti and safely assume that they're probably running DAP node. We still don't know 
in which hardware, like if it's hardware that we have uh, that we have sold them or or not. Um, so we can have an idea of how many validators, but again, there's a decoupling of validator to hardware, and we don't know if two validators are running on on the same hardware either. So it's very 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 hard for us to know uh, or to to even estimate the amount of DAP nodes that are that that exist out there. This is what you think. So kind of like the, the graffiti there being a good indicator. Do you remember like 15 years ago or so when people started sending emails from their iPhones and kind of it would say send from iPhone, but then kind of everyone would kind of copy that kind of like on their Huawei's and kind of, you know, put like send from my iPhone below because kind of just uh, this, this is what you did, right? Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Joking aside. So sure. you don't know how many, how many people are running DAP nodes, but how many DAP nodes have you sold? Uh, we have sold around 2000 DAP nodes. Okay. Okay. If you could go back to the very start of DAP Note, is there anything you would do differently, Edu? Oh, uh, this is a really good question. Other things, so, to be honest. I mean, we build this with um, very strong principles. We keep that uh, from the very beginning, and I'm really proud of being maintaining that. Maybe, uh, I don't know, at some point, maybe try to find a small uh, business model to sustain this project could be interesting, maybe. Because, for instance, as we have been talking, we don't know how many people are running down for validating ETH or what else is. We have this self-reported uh, graffiti. But at some point, we were running around 1% of the Ethereum network. And, and this is a lot, a lot. And we were not taking anything from that, just surviving with grants and and and, and both the selling of hardware. But yeah, probably probably just to get a little more for for making this bigger because obviously when you don't have um, this business business model business models for for this kind of software, it's really really hard to maintain it, especially at the very beginning. Uh, so maybe try to find something in the middle, although. If I need to choose, I prefer the, the, the path that, that I took in the past. But yeah, obviously, make our lives easier to build this. It will be, it will be great at some point. <laughs> you had a pretty large upgrade recently, Node Smooth. Talk about that and kind of how that fits into the broader Node ecosystem. So I think uh, we realized the importance of Smooth uh, when... When we realized that we are paying less to solo stakers overall than to big centralized players, and uh, and and you could you'll go like what wait what what do you mean we're paying less uh, these people? And uh, the reason why why I say this is because um, we have taken this MEV path. On 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 Ethereum, and we have decided to 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 manage the the block building on this like proto PBS uh, that that the MEV uh, MEV boost uh, enables. And what what this does is basically um, MEV distribution is follows a power law, which means that very very few blocks will have huge MEV rewards, and the great majority of blocks will have, you know, not so great MEV rewards. Um, what that makes is that if you're a big pool that has thousands of validators and you're constantly producing blocks, you are bound to get some lot, some of these big payout, big MEV blocks, which are also known as lottery blocks. So if you get one of these lottery blocks, what these big pools do is they do not keep that to a particular validator, right? Because the validators within a pool are fungible. So basically they distribute this huge reward among all of the validators of the same pool. And that brings the execution reward higher for all of the blogs in that pool. The inverse scenario is like a solo staker that has one validator and proposes around two to three blocks per year. The chance of this validator getting a lottery block is tiny, very small. Um, so most likely, the most likely scenario is that in a year, 
one validator that is a solo validator will not have exposure to a lottery block and will have a small reward. Whereas uh, one validator that is part of a big pool will have a higher return because they will have exposure to the lottery blocks that have fallen into, into this pool. So if we agree that home stakers are more valuable than one marginal validator in a data center because they give more resilience, more geographical decentralization, more, ge more geopolitical protection, more uh, censorship resistance. So if we agree that home stakers are more valuable in terms of decentralization and resilience for the network, why are we paying them less? But is it really the expected value? So kind of like if, I mean, if I kind of, it in the infinite margin, so kind of like uh, I kind of, I run a solo validator forever, kind of I will hit upon a lottery block and I won't have to share with anyone. I will get to keep it all for myself. So doesn't that kind of make up? Yes, exactly. Um, but at like in an infinite timeline, you are bound to get a lottery block, but you might get it in 200 years. Uh, or in 80 years, or who knows if Ethereum will exist. So in a five years timeline, you are much better off joining a smoothing pool because you in, in five years, you would produce 10 blocks, for example, 10 to 15 blocks. And that's still very, very, very little. Uh, and that is if we continue at, uh, at our current level of validators, which it seems that it has stabilized a little bit lately. Okay, so after we realized that that the uh, solo stakers were sort of like being shortchanged on their execution rewards, we decided to like build a pool for their execution rewards. And that's literally what it is. Like the solution to this is basically we all pool together our execution rewards into the same smart contract, which uh, then distributes these rewards among all of the participants of the pool. Therefore, if one of us gets a lottery block, everybody else gets their share of this lottery block. So yes, if you get a lottery block when you are in the pool, you will have to share this lottery block with everybody else. But the thing is, you cannot possibly know in advance that it is going to be you who will earn this lottery block. So that's the trade-off. You either decide to have higher than expected execution rewards by joining the pool or decide to play the lottery and have overalls or most likely a scenario where you have less rewards than if you had joined the pool, but you get exposure to this huge lottery block that you might get. So it's kind of like insurance, inverse insurance. So I get a payout every month, but kind of if I become very sick, kind of, uh, did, kind of, uh, did I... Uh, I also kind of the insurance pays that for me, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tell me about uh, kind of uh, Dapp Node Smooth and the business model. It also changes things on your end, right? Yes, yes, certainly. I think um, so. We've decided to charge a fee for Smooth because it basically. So what happens? What the numbers? The actual numbers of joining Smooth. Um, is that you will you're expected to double your execution rewards. Um, so basically, you if you consider execution and, and consensus rewards, you you basically maybe like a, you increase your total rewards of a validator by 20 25 percent, something like that. If you're participating in these and you can double your rewards, we've decided to take a seven percent fee of all of the rewards that go into the pool. Um, and that sort of like changes what Edo was saying before, right? Like uh, up until now, uh, we we didn't have any business model built into Dapnode. And that's because Dapnode makes it extremely easy to, to run validators and stuff. But uh, we didn't quite develop any client implementations. And basically what you're doing with Dapnode is you're, you're basically running other people's uh, software, right? So charging for this, I mean, could have been an option, but we decided not to go for it. Um, but here, it is something that we have created, and it's something that actually gives you value, gives actual value to the user. It gives double the expected execution rewards. So we decided to charge a fee here, and that brings in or starts bringing in this business model that can make Dapnode sustainable. 
are there technical challenges to kind of um, develop and implement that node smooth? Because it kind of from from the face of it, it sounds like a pretty straightforward pooling contract, no? Yeah, maybe maybe the most challenging thing here is the Oracle, because at the end, uh, as most of you know, uh, there is a disconnection between the things that are happening on the execution layer and the things that are happening on the consensus layer. So it's not possible to, to correlate this data. So that is why we needed to build um, an Oracle. Um, obviously, well, uh, we have been talking here, we are not uh, too, much, too much aligned with Oracles probably, but I mean, we create a system of uh, different Oracles providing the same value. And obviously, we envision a, a future in which we can replace this uh, oracle for a thin knowledge proof of the of the result. But uh, the most complex part of, of this is, uh, smoothing pool has been the, the oracle because it's the one that takes care of the, the the results of the things that are happening on the consensus layer and posting this data on chain. Um, but yeah, following the the culture of Dabnot, we obviously did all, everything open source and anyone can run its own Oracle to, to double check that everything is fine. So we are trying to to be aligned with, with our spirit. It's, it's, I mean, we, we have a mantra in Dabnot is decentralized until it hurts, uh, centralized <laughs> until it works. And we try to follow that from the very beginning. And Because at some point there are some things that you cannot decentralize. Uh, I'm just thinking about... For instance, um, you mentioned about automatic updates. Well, we have a connection to Telegram. So if you use a bot in Telegram, you can get uh, notifications in Telegram. Uh, but obviously, this is obtained. And there is no way to send a decentralized notification to a user. <laughs> so uh, at some point, you need to find this one, right? In the, in, and, and, and yeah, a balance between decentralization and centralization to make the things work. So what's been the feedback like from the community for Dev Node Smooth? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good one. Uh, people who have joined, they absolutely love it. They Some people were saying like, hey, I, I haven't even proposed a block, but I'm already accumulating rewards. And I don't know what the reward of my next, my first block is going to be, but I, I know that I know exactly, it gives me this predictability on exactly how much uh, how much am I going to get, right? Um, I think most of the bad feedback has been uh, like not really understanding the difference between the expected rewards, which are around the median, and the uh, rewards that you can, or, or how smooth gets your rewards closer to the average. Uh, people have uh, some some trouble understanding the difference, and I have a I've come up with a with a quite an easy way of explaining it. Um, how how the median and the and the average are different. So imagine that there's like um, there's a company, and uh, we are all part of this company, and the owner is very fair. The owner pays uh, one thousand euros to each employee, including himself. Um, so every month, everybody gets the same. So the the median salary, uh, the median is defined by if you put all of the uh, the numbers or the salaries in order from the biggest to the smaller, the one that's right in the middle is the median, right? And it's clear to see that if we're 10 employees, the, the median will be like 1,000. It's uh, And the average, which is defined as uh, adding up all of the numbers and uh, dividing by the number of instances of salaries, so uh, adding up the 1,000 dividing by 10, uh, that's also 1,000, okay? So that's, these in Ethereum are the consensus rewards. They're equal for everyone. Now, imagine that the end of the year comes and me, as the owner, decide to pay myself dividends, and I pay myself uh, like I pay myself like 90k of dividends. It's a huge payoff. Not not 1,000, but like like 90k. So basically, at this point, um, on that particular month, everybody will have their salary of 1,000, including myself. But I will have a massive bonus of 90k. So let's look at the median for that month. The median for that month is going to be take all of the salaries, put them 
one after the other, and the median is still 1,000. But if you take the average, you add up all of the rewards that you've been given, that's going to be 10K, or it's like 100K. So if you make the average, the average of the 100K divided by the number of employees, divided by 10, it's 10K. But this number is meaningless to you as an employee. If you hear, oh, the, the average salary in, or the average compensation in that, uh, in that company is 10K, well, for you, that is not the owner, that, uh, like, that means nothing. And what you're interested in or what you're going to get is 1,000, not 10K, right? Um, so something, something like this happens, except that we don't have owners um, in, in Ethereum or like not, in, not in the traditional sense, not in the same sense. But the, like, we, what we have is people who are lucky enough to have one of these lottery blocks. And this, if somebody gets a lottery block, it pushes the average up. But that doesn't mean that it means anything to you who most likely are never going to get one of these lottery blocks. So if you sort of like trust the prob your probability or like look at the probability of you having one of these lottery blocks and on a, as you very well said before, in a time span of five years, how many blocks am I going to propose? How many of those have a chance of being a, a lottery block? What you're going to end up is that your reward is going to be closer to the median. What you can expect is closer to the median. Um, now, what Smooth does is really pooling this 90k of bonus that I gave, pooling it and making it and giving it to everybody. It's like instead of being a, a company, it's a cooperative and we all divide all of, the, all of the benefits amongst everybody, which really does bring the total compensation to uh, 10k instead of uh, for everybody, yeah. So, so what proportion of Dab Node users have opted into Smooth? Well, that would be an amazing question to answer if we knew how many dab node users <laughs> we have. <laughs> I think it's important to mention that uh, dab node smooth simple is not only for dab node users; it's for that's any right. sort so of everyone. Taker. Okay. And and right now we have uh, almost two thousand uh, validators on it, uh, and yeah, we, we're getting considerably considerable smoothing effects already. Like we we are hitting some lottery blocks. I think the biggest one that uh, that we got was uh, around 13, 14 ETH, something like that. Wow. Um, let's talk about kind of like staking, kind of from a bird's eye perspective, right? So kind of solo staking um, as admirable uh, and virtuous as it is. Um, it's kind of um, economically, it's often not the best way of kind of like using your ETH, right? So kind of like if I um, use a liquid staking protocol, I can kind of earn uh, rewards um, on my ETH and at the same time kind of use it as collateral somewhere else because kind of it becomes fungible, right? So I don't, I don't have um, the 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 uh, uh, the opportunity cost that I kind of have when I stake. Um, how do you see that? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a really good question. So, um, the the thing that we are seeing, or at least from my point of view, is that uh, is at some point we are putting the incentives in the wrong place. I mean, as Paul mentioned before, um, we should incentivize more the the solar staking. But the thing that is happening is, is the percent. Is, I mean, the people that are not doing solar staking are having more benefits, are having um, less uh, uh, less uh, or more facilities to make this happen, and especially with the liquid staking, as you mentioned now. Um, what I expect in the future is to have these liquid staking solutions combined with DBT, because now, right now one of the big issues for, for Dabnot and for solar staking is that thirty-two is, uh, is a lot of money, and not all the people can afford that, obviously. So, if we are able to combine these DBT solutions and liquid staking and make anyone to be part of this decentralized network validation in um, in a way that um, make easy makes as easy for them and also provide this value of, of liquid staking. I think it's the, the feature that we need to expect or, or the thing that we are trying to achieve because otherwise we are going to end up in the same situation in the past, like in Bitcoin, where most of the the miners are controlled by the same people. And, and from the very beginning of Ethereum, 
the centralization was always uh, one of there, and, and that is why today we are able to run validators on a consumer hardware, because it was always one of the principles of Ethereum. So I hope that in the future we can start to go this direction of, of being able to to take the same benefit or even more for solar staker and, and not benefit the ones that are going in the centralized direction or the centralized path. You just mentioned DVT. Um, c can you maybe uh, explain that? Yeah, sure. I mean, the thing is currently um, the keys to make a signature uh, of a validator um, has they, they have a lot of power and, and they can sign a message, they can slash you. So you have an issue. You cannot um, decentralize this key or give this key of validation to anyone because they can um, extort you, they can do bad things with this key. So the idea behind of DBT, of the DBT technology, is to create a way in which no one has the control of this key, and with the signature of three or five or uh, N of N uh, pa um, members of this committee, they can make this signature of the validation. This allows us to give this power of validation without exposing and, and to be exposed to the risk of, of exposing the key. So the idea behind of this DBT is just to create um, a small groups of people sharing a key, but not having the control of this key, allowing to anyone to call, uh, to trash on this decentralized manner of signing things. And if you put this together with liquid staking, you can take ether from people, give a liquid derivative of this ether, and put this ether to validate on a decentralized system of people running this new technology. So that's distributed validation, right? So kind of like you need less than 32 ETH um, and you can kind of pull those together and kind of you can do it in a trustless manner. Is that more or less it? Yeah, yeah, much better than my inspiration for sure. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> <you>. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm, yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so kind of why, why would that kind of eliminate the opportunity cost that people currently face when they solo stake? Yeah, uh, the thing is that Currently, you go can run 32, uh, I mean, one validator, 32 is, I mean, obviously, we, with an OCG, it's, it's, it's just one video, so it's much, much easier talking about the difficulties. That, and mainly, that is why we have more validators in, in OCG rather than in the probably, because it's more affordable, it's more accessible for, for users to be part of the network. But in the case of OCG, you can only run 32 is 64, so it's a lot of money. Um, Probably, if you have a hardware, uh, you were willing to run, I don't know, 100, uh, 1,000 validators in the same hardware, right? But you are not uh, having access to this big amount of, of either, or maybe some people, but not, not the regular people. So the thing is to find, I mean, it's like we have a pool of people having and maintaining hardware, willing to run validators for other ones. And in the other side, we have people with ETH willing to decentralize this. So at the moment that you are able to trust on this decentralized hardware layer of people validating, maybe you at home are not going to run only a solo staker. I mean, you can run your validator, this 32 ETH, plus validators from other people from this pool, allowing you to get more benefits and, and reduce your operational costs because you are just running your validator plus the validators of other ones and getting the reward of, of doing this, this job for them. So, yeah, <laughs> maybe this is the idea. But you can't use the stake ETH as collateral as you can kind of do when you um, have liquid staking, right? Kind of like when, when, when I liquid stake, I get a liquid token back that I can use as collateral elsewhere to kind of uh, take out more ETH or whatever, right? And kind of earn yield on that as well. So kind of I can leverage up. Yeah, as a user, I think I would say it's even better what you can do, which is you can, you, you can put... You can be running and operating a validator without a bond. And so, as Zedo was saying, there's there's these people who have the ETH and they need to be running like the pools or centralized exchanges or uh, or liquid staking pools. They have the ETH and there's no reason why before DBT they would they would untrust random users on the internet to, to run their validators, to run validators for them, because they owe it to the people who have surrendered their liquidity, uh, their actual ETH for staking, they owe it to offer them a proper yield. And if like they, they need to ensure that the operations of these validators are okay. Now with DVT, what they can do is they can, they can give it to groups of random people on the internet 
that they've gathered together. They've created a DVT cluster, and and now they can present themselves as credible node operators. Because if one of them goes down, as it's as it would be perfectly normal on a home setup, the rest of the cluster picks up the slack. And what they can do, so as an operator, now let's let's look at it like as an operator, you don't even need to actually be a staker to benefit from the like the, the rewards of operating. So you will get paid as an infrastructure provider, not as a staker anymore. So you're basically, you don't even have to put up any capital. So right now, there's only uh, one program that uh, that does this, or I think maybe two programs that do this, that they require no no bond. Um, there's Etherfy with the Operation Solo Staker, and they manage their DVT clusters, uh, and they, they give ETH from the Etherfy protocol uh, for them to, to, to run validators on. And then there's the simple DVT module of Lido. So in order to participate in either of those, you don't really need to put up any bond. So there's literally no cost of opportunity. You just need to run the hardware. Okay, and I, I understand that kind of if you're the person kind of running the hardware, but if you ha you're the person with the ETH, aren't you still better off kind of doing this in a way where kind of you get a fungible token back that you can use in things? Because kind of like when you kind of stake um, kind of in a DVT um, setup, you get no fungible token back that you can you can still utilize, right? Yeah, that is correct. You you don't if if you want if you have the ETH and you want to have a liquid representation for it, uh, you're obviously better off. Like DVT is not useful for that. Then you have like other things, like you can create like a uh, a vault on stakewise and. Uh, that will create a liquid representation of the ETH staked in that vault. And then you're, what you're introducing is you're introducing a layer of smart contract complexity in here. But if you're okay with this, then you can transform the ETH of your vault into OS ETH, which is uh, which then you can use on DeFi. So you, you can totally do that yep. as well. by Not okay. necessarily by using DVT, but by using other solutions like stakewise vaults. Okay, yeah, I, I, I understand. The other, the other thing that kind of gets discussed very critically is restaking. What's your take? <laughs> I oh. hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe just very quickly in a nutshell, kind of restaking is the idea that you can use the same collateral twice to kind of stake four different things. So kind of like if you already have ETH staked on Ethereum, you could also use it to validate on seven other protocols and kind of be slashed on the same ETH, um, which kind of allows you to kind of multiply the yield you can generate on that ETH. It also possibly overloads the security consensus. So um, yeah, what, what's your take? Yeah, so uh, I think it, it is a great idea in practice. Uh, having all of these ETH sitting there um, is... Uh, and, and not being slashed is could be like could be seen by some people as like a a waste, right? Like uh, all of this ETH that only serves to validate Ethereum, um, and it could be reused for for other protocols. So, but mostly, I think it's given way to greed and the ability to, or the the willingness to get more rewards. Uh, out of the same ETH, and this basically endangers uh, endangers Ethereum as a whole. Like in the case of a mass a slashing event on the restaking protocol, um, like ETH could see uh, like like this. Let, let's let's bear in mind that this is actually not ETH that it's not staked at the same level as the um, as the consensus layer, so it's not. Uh, burned, uh, but it it will be sold and it will basically dump the price. So uh, a massive re-slashing event, uh, re-staking slashing event would uh, would be very very negative for Ethereum. And I think it's something that has to be like it it is okay to be tried slowly. Um, but I think it's been overblown and. Um, uh, sort of incentivized with all these points protocols and uh, it increases risk and complexity in a way that we stop being in 
uh, in control of the financial products that are built on top of uh, staked uh, of, of the security of the consensus uh, of uh, of Ethereum, and it exposes the consensus of Ethereum to uh, a lot of complexity in the same way as the repackaged mortgages uh, exposed the financial system um, to to a lot of risk in a way that we could not possibly understand what was what was going on behind the financial products that, that were uh, that, that were created in 2008 for example Edu, do you agree yeah I mean I totally agree with Paul is I mean is this feeling that we are putting leverage leverage on, on the ether and I mean when the things are in the right direction everything looks good but uh, the moment that you are increasing this leverage, um, if something goes wrong, it can be a complete disaster. So uh, at the end of the day, I think it's also important how uh, how much, I mean, how this growth, this, this risk taking. I mean, at the low level, I think we can be more or less safe. But if this becomes massive, I think the, the risk that we are taking is like putting leverage on Ethereum itself. So I think... Uh, we need to take this into account um, because, yeah, I am in this um, chain effect that can happen. It's, you have linked everything, so if something happens in one chain, uh, it can be a massive uh, situation for the other ones and, and be a wave that uh, destroy everything. So, yeah, this is feeling that, um, in principle, it's a really great idea. I mean, but when you start to think about all the consequences that this can bring to the, the ecosystem, well, it's, the feeling is that it's, it's really risky. Oh, that's my, my point. The other larger topic that's currently very much um, under debate is issuance. So um, kind of the idea that kind of if you already have a million validators, having another validators of very limited marginal value, whereas kind of if you only have, say, 10 validators, having an 11th is uh, of much bigger value. So where, where do you stand on, on that debate? So kind of how do you measure the value added by each additional validator? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the issue is, uh, is probably also a hard topic. I have heard voice in different directions about this. How... how how to measure the success of a network. From my point of view, is how much you are able to make it decentralized. Uh, other people is mission or other things. Uh, for me, if you are increasing the issue of the network, you are getting probably more rewards. So that means that more people are going to get into the ecosystem. But the thing is, since the current Ethereum network is, is incentivizing more decentralized way to do the things, uh, because this network flows to centralized providers, probably the thing that you are going to see is just more people with more money. <laughs> or that is my feeling. So at the end, even I, I prefer the opposite, just to have people that really believe on the, on, on the core values and, and not being here only for the rewards. So probably in the direction of of, uh, of uh, reducing the issue, or not increasing the issue at all. <laughs> and, but yeah, I mean, uh, at the end of it depends also, I mean, if you are able to, to create a more decentralized network, that's my point and, and that's my feeling. I think it all stems from the impossibility to know um, what what is a decentralized validator that actually adds more value. Like if we had a a proper way of measuring this, um, then it would be very easy. Like, okay, we we keep the centralized, or we have some sort of like asymptotic rewards curve on on how many validators uh, you you can have. So the first validators increase your reward quite a bit, and the like after like you reach a certain plateau of validators, then your issuance or your like the ETH that you mint on your validators, your consensus rewards, uh, lowers or tapers down. The like, of course, this is an extremely naive approach, and it would uh, being at the completely decentralized platform, what this would uh, what this would do is like it it would give uh, raise to like a lot of civil attacks, and uh, and people would pretend to have uh, low validators. So that's not something that's on the cards right now. 
and like if we like i i honestly don't think reducing issuance is a good idea because um there is a lib like we see it in our community a lot of people in dabnode um even though they are like we we said that they are ideologically motivated at least in part they do also want rewards and it's not that they hate money you know like they they do like they do like their rewards and they want to maximize them and if the rewards go down above like below a, th a certain threshold they will stop validating but other big institutions or people who are less hands-on or people that have less cost of opportunity um for for running their own validators those they they might be okay unless the issuance is uh negative so uh, with a non with a non negative or non zero uh, issuance uh, or reward they they would be okay on keeping this so i see reducing issuance in a naive way just reducing it um i see it also as a negative for the decentralization of the of the network now there are some things that that i think could be done so right now we have correlation penalties for uh, slashing events, um, and it is suggested that we could have correlation penalties for missed attestations as well, for being offline. And I think it would be really funny if there would be a way of reward so there's there's this thing there's the unicorn unicorn chaos day i think it's the status team that that implemented it unicorn chaos day is a day where people try to hack their own the, the things that they are building themselves they, they it's just a day for testing security i think it would be amazing to implement something like this in ethereum something where if you can prove that you are making the an entire group of validators go down at the same time and miss attestations if you can prove that it was you you get part of these correlated attestation penalties. You get them for yourself. So you're still like only playing, it's it's a safe game because you're still only playing with like missed attestations. You're not uh you're not slashing the principles or so to speak. Um and it could be targeted at like players that have or like yeah play, uh, like more having more than 1000 validators for example. So if you manage and you can prove that it's you who like destroyed a data center not destroyed sorry like uh, went uh, like effectively um attacked a group of validators that that are an easy target because they're all together then you get part of the reward and that would be an interesting case where people would be like actively watchtowering um the be watchtowers for for these uh, centralized actors right and that would mean that it's less profitable to run validators in a centralized spot because you're risking yourself to being attacked. And if you have to decentralize them in different in different spots, that will also increase your costs. So it will be less, you'll be able to uh, give less profit to the liquid staking representation. So uh, at the same time, solo stakers do not, are not affected because they usually run less than 1000 validators. So uh, they, would, they wouldn't be a target for, for these sort of people. So effectively what this does is it increases the costs of securing their own infrastructure operations for big players. And it has no impact on solo stakers. I'd, I'd like to, to see something like that implemented. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you guys have in store um, over the next, you know, months or years with that node? Yeah, um, uh, I think the, so we've been talking a lot about staking uh, and the issuance right now is quite low, and we're not seeing that much influx on on staking, right? So, a lot of what's happening internally in Dapnode is looking at ways to leverage these hardware already existing in people's homes um, to give them access to uh, privacy-preserving technologies or uh, self-sovereign technologies in a way that they that that they're using that hardware that's giving them some some sort of return um, in order to provide more value out of it. And here what we're talking about is we're talking about running local models, for example. Um, we have a proof of concept where we have local models running on a DAB note and you can communicate with them through a Telegram bot the same way as you speak on a chat interface with ChatGPT. But instead of uh, ChatGPT and giving your away all of your uh, data to OpenAI, you're talking to your own local model, right? 
I think the the future of open source and local AI is is really brilliant because um, we there are certain things that we are not going to uh, we we are not so basically AIs are are this sort of like exocortexes like these third party brains that that we pay to access right and um, like for some things like work um, we're we're going to be using stuff that is that is the maximum of the foundational model that's the maximum performance. But at some point, we will want something that is ours, some agent that is not tamperable, some agent that really works for us and that is controlled by us and maybe decides whether um, we can ask a foundational model or uh, we can we can have our own um, or, or we will use our own data to do to do something like this. So that that note, I think it's perfectly positioned to. To provide those services, um, and that's sort of like what we're looking into right now. Super interesting. Yeah, my point of this is just to think about a lot of applications that uh, in which privacy and EA matters. Like, for instance, imagine that um, you can connect your local model to your Google Drive, um, and you can make. Um, index queries on the data and ask for, I don't know, anything in your in your documents or in your photos or in your back accounts or imagine to connect um, AI to your uh, emails and make uh, summaries of all your emails or your Telegram conversation or just to remember. I mean, I see a lot of applications in which um, AI can help you a lot, but is so sensible. The information that you want to take a look is so sensible that you have no, not you are not going to never connect to a centralized provider. You are not going Absolutely. to bank accounts. And this point, and also because it's also part of our core values, mixing the privacy with this technology that provides a lot of value. I see a lot of potential application that makes total sense and and can bring a new paradigm on this on these new applications. Cool, fantastic. Guys, um, where can people learn more uh, about Dabnode, uh, download the software, buy uh, hardware even, um, and how can they be in touch with you guys? Right, so um, dabnode.com is our website, the A-P-P, node, N-O-D-E, dabnode.com. That's, uh, that's our website and all of our socials are also listed there. And we have a... a super great Discord community that really helps both with the installations of the open source software and also with support and also like uh, providing feedback for the hardware, etc. and with guides on, to, on how to do things on Dabnode. So we have an amazing community. Uh, our Discord is probably uh, the best way of uh, interacting with this community and see if Dabnode is for you. From the website as well, you can you can download the software to your own machine, or you can uh, access the shop and buy a plug and play hardware that will bring Dabnode to your home without any technical knowledge. Perfect. Thank you both for coming on. Thank you for having us. Thanks again for inviting us. Yeah. <laughs>